Why do we talk about the particular way that you came to understand afresh the nature of the first chapters of Genesis, Bill? Um, uh, you know, a, a lot of people, you know, go through this without necessarily investigating the science as well. But but they're asking, is it history? Is it poetry? Is it some sort of myth? Now, you obviously spend some time sort of developing what we mean by myth anyway, because it can cover a whole range of things. Um, so so, yeah, to. to what what did you come to in the end? Just just elaborate on this this particular category that you described it as at the beginning of the show, and and how you came to that conclusion. I first became familiar with this through the Old Testament scholar and Genesis commentator Bill Arnold, who also spoke at these conferences where Josh and I met, and I had never heard this approach to Genesis one to eleven before, and it launched me into um, a study of these first 11 chapters uh, and Old Testament literature on this uh, genre, as well as reading in the literature of folklore studies with respect to understanding what myth is in the folklorist sense. A myth in the sense of, that the folklorist uses the word does not mean a falsehood like the myth of a low-calorie diet or the myth of the self-made man, the way we often use that word today. For a folklorist, a myth is a traditional, sacred narrative told in a culture which attempts to ground that culture and its values in events in the deep primordial past. And these myths will typically involve grand themes like the origin of the world, the origin of humanity, the flood, and so forth. And so the same sorts of grand themes that you find in Genesis 1 to 11 are characteristic of other ancient Mesopotamian myths. Now, this does not, I argue, show borrowing on the part of ancient Hebrews, but what it does show is that it's the same kind of literature it, it belongs to the genre of myth in the folklorist sense. But mm. it is also mm. coupled with these genealogies that structure the primeval history. And that shows a historical interest. It tries to locate these events in ordinary, causally connected human history. And it was that feature that led this a seriologist, Torkel Jakobsen, to say that this is a unique kind of literature that he dubbed mytho-history. And I give around nine characteristics that one can use to identify um, myth in ancient literature. And Genesis really fits the bill for those first 11 chapters. And so I think that a very plausible case can be made that this is the correct literary analysis. Interestingly enough, for your listeners, I think, this was an insight that C.S. Lewis had long ago. Lewis was a scholar of folklore and mythology, and he recognized this genre in the first 11 chapters of Genesis. And I think he was quite right about that, and a good number of Old Testament scholars recognize this as well. And what's significant about this, the bottom line is, that this type of literature shouldn't be pressed for literalistic precision. It uses figurative language and metaphor and images to communicate the deep theological truths. So Bill, to reiterate and to clarify for leader, readers, so a lot of people have heard this before, and then it ends with saying, well, so Adam and Eve were just mythical people who were just figurative didn't exist in the past. But you actually think there's a historical kernel. Yes. You would even say that they are the genealogical ancestors of all of us. In that sense, it's a type of genealogical Adam and Eve. And that's the difference between pure myth and what Jakobson called mytho-history. We are dealing here with people that were real and actually lived.